Greetings, Midwest Remarks viewers. The following is a lecture presentation from Dr. Thomas Riggins. He is the Chief Editorial Counselor for Midwest Remarks and Editor at the Journal of American Socialist Studies. He is a retired philosophy and humanities professor who has taught in institutes such as NYU, the New School for Social Research, amongst many more. He's published thousands of articles in dozens of magazines and journals, and he is the author of the forthcoming book published by the Midwestern Marx Publishing Press, Reading the Classical Texts of Marxism. In this video, you're going to watch him present a lecture on the first preface to the first German edition of Capital, published in 1867. I hope you enjoy. Yes, the importance of this article, I thought, is for people who are just beginning to uh, study capital. Uh, it uh, can be a very uh, difficult book to begin to start. That first chapter is very difficult for a lot of people to read. <clears throat> so I thought uh, a lot of people just jump into the book and skip the prefaces and introductions and get into the meat of it. They get... Um, <clears throat> bogged down in that first chapter. So I thought if they would uh, read the prefaces and the afterwards first, they'd get a basic idea of what Marx was doing, and they, they wouldn't have that difficulty in the first chapter. So it's um, been recommended by some philosophy teachers that they skip the first chapter entirely because it is very difficult. It's difficult because he uses Hegelian terminology in there which he doesn't use in the rest of the book, basically. And if you just start with chapter two, you'll be able to understand what's going on. Uh, and when you read at the end, then you go back and read the first chapter. So you can do it either way. <clears throat> if you want to start with the first chapter and you have a problem with it, just come back to that after you read the, the rest of the book. There, when you read Marx and when you read these prefaces, he's going to use some terminology He's going to talk about laws, the laws of capitalism and the inevitability of this and the inevitability of that. And then he also uses the term tendencies of this and tendencies of that. So it's important to realize what Das Kapital is about. It is not describing any particular capitalism. He's using Britain as an illustration of a capitalist country, but what he is constructing is a model of how a capitalist system would work under ideal conditions. It's like in, in physics where you make the laws of what happens on falling objects and stuff and you, you discount friction and it's, it's like what they would do in a vacuum, okay? There's been a real vacuum, but the laws are if it's in a vacuum. But in real life, the feather doesn't fall the same rate as the cannonball does. But there's a tendency in the real life for them to go down at the same speed. And then because there's friction, the feather doesn't go down as fast. But in theory, they do. And the mathematics is for the theoretical model. So the model of capitalism is what you're going to read in, in Das Kapital. Illustrations of how this works will uh, be taken basically from England and some other countries. So when you are reading the laws of capitalism when you're applying them to an actual country, you should flip over and, and use the word tendencies. There's a tendency for markets to fall apart. Uh, they, they usually fall apart, but sometimes they, they recover and so it doesn't collapse like you think it is. So, but in the, in the model will show you exactly how capitalism, a perfect capitalism, a perfect laissez-faire capitalism would work. <clears throat> but we now know real capitalism is that way. But that model is what we use to understand the world around us and the tendencies there. Okay, so we have to say, he says in there, when you do look at real history, the beginning of the understanding of class struggle, which became a apparent to, to Marx and Engels and others in the 19th century was the big feature that started this was the American insurrection or the, or the American War of Independence. He doesn't refer to it as a revolution in the, in the prefaces. He calls it the American War of 
independence. Now, don't forget, slavery was still maintained in this war of independence. The Declaration of Independence maintained slavery. In fact, when you get past the, uh, the nice, beautiful part and you get into the actual grievances that the Americans have against the English is that they, they're encouraging the end of slavery and they're being on the Indian side. <clears throat> so so that, that, we don't go over that part when we talk about the, the we just talk about all men are created equal. But that idea that you didn't need the feudalists, you didn't need monarchy, you, you didn't need an aristocracy to rule you that people themselves could rule themselves was, he called it the toxin of the revolution, the toxin is like a bell ringing, uh, of what the future would happen with the overthrow of the aristocracy, the feudal aristocracy and the coming to power of the people. Now, the, the people are all of the people who are not in the nobility. They're all the people who are, are not part of the aristocracy and the uh, royalty and the dukes and the earls who run the country, the lords of the land. And they include two classes of people, they, the bourgeoisie, uh, merchants, and working people. They're all together there. Uh, and the peasantry, these are all the people who are oppressed. And they're sort of fighting together to overthrow, if we go from the United States over to France for the French Revolution, they're trying to overthrow the monarchy and the old ruling class that they've inherited from the, from the Middle Ages. It's not until that battle is won that the differences between the interests of the bourgeoisie and the peasantry and the workers start to dawn on the two allies of the bourgeoisie that they're not getting all of the benefits from this revolution and that there's the bourgeoisie has sort of replaced the nobility as the, an exploiting class. And so they're still getting the short end of the stick. Okay, so that's, that's he, he talks about that. It goes into the French Revolution, which is a bourgeois revolution. We always talk about the Jacobins and Robespierre and how radical the, uh, the revolutionaries were. They kept cut off the king's head. Uh, they abolished slavery in the in the colonies. Over there. It was reimposed after the you know, by the, by Napoleon, basically, <clears throat> the people that put Napoleon in power. But the Jacobins, who no matter how radical they were, they made laws against the working people to keep down their salaries and. They couldn't strike, and they, so. But nevertheless, that was it. Was a this revolution had to take place uh, in order to get the ball rolling. Now he says it wasn't until 1830 that the working class took part in a revolution and began to get class consciousness. But they didn't run the 1830 revolution. If you if you uh, uh, read the Ugo book, I can think of the name now, Le Miserable. If you read Le Miserable, that's taking place during the time of the 1830 revolution in France. That's when the bourgeoisie actually becomes the ruling class in France. With the help of the workers, the workers don't become self-consciously fighting for working class interests uh, for another 18 years, and that's going to be the 1848 revolution. So he talks about that. He talks about the fact that revolutions can be either humane, because we're all civilized people, or they can be brutal, where heads get chopped off and buildings are put on fire and everything. And this will depend on the development of the level of consciousness and the economic development of the workers when they make a move to end their exploitation. If they are brutally, if they have a brutal ruling class, a dictatorship, they will be brutal because you fight fire with fire. If you have a really democratic, perfectly good bourgeois democratic liberal society uh, where everybody is going to obey the rules of elections, you can have a, a peaceful transition, okay? This is a theory they're thinking about. Uh, remember these books, this 
this book was published in 1867. <clears throat> it, was, it was written in the, in the middle of the 19th century, so they haven't really figured out what's going on. Um, Marx says that it's in the interest of the working of the capitalist class to help the working class and not oppress it too much. In fact, he thinks they should uh, if they want, if workers want to unionize and form worker societies to better themselves and, and to negotiate with the capitalists, the capitalists, the capitalists have all the power. They should, they should encourage that by making the working class think that the capitalists are their friends and by giving them more crumbs, uh, they, uh, which really wouldn't hurt the capitalists that much to so give them more crumbs than they actually give them. Um, they will have. If a revolution takes place, the capitalists will be able to keep their heads. But if they are real nasty capitalists, like we have here in the United States, they might not be able to keep their heads, okay? But then the workers here haven't got that consciousness yet. All right, so they should be um, nice to the working class if they're not, they weren't very nice to the working people in Russia. And so they got a working class out for blood. And they, the working class got into power. And there was a lot of violence. And we all know what happened in in Russia with the kulaks and, and with the show trials. All of the all of these things were a reaction of the working people having been so repressed that um, they didn't feel charitable towards people that they thought were their enemies, rightly or wrongly. The same thing in China, when many of the landlords were occurred during the Chinese Revolution, that it wasn't that the Chinese communists were particularly being nasty, but when they were liberating the peasants and from these areas, they brought the landlords out and let the peasants vote on what to do with their own landlords. The landlords who had been nice who said, oh, your wife is sick, you don't have to pay the tax this month or whatever. Those landlords didn't get their heads chopped off, but the, the landlords that you, you know, you see in the old movies, Simon Legree type landlords or slave driver types, the, the peasants had them killed, okay? So it's, all, it's always uh, good if you're going to be a member of the ruling class not to oppress your uh, slaves too much. You saw, you saw what happened with Spartacus. Romans, but the Romans had to go through to get rid of Spartacus. Okay, so another thing um, that he says in these prefaces and afterwards, and this is the first one to the to the first German edition of 1867, something that had been ignored and is still ignored by some people was he says capitalism is a the model of capitalism is an evolutionary development out of the, uh, the historical economic systems of the past. It has to go through certain stages as it matures and ripens. And when it matures and ripens, you'll find that it has within it, because it's exploiting people, it has, and it needs markets that it's going to run out of markets. Uh, it's, it's going to have collapses when they make too much and they can't sell it, uh, eventually that system will begin to self-destruct. But that's when it's fully formed and is no longer able to expand. At that's the point at which the revolution will take place. That is, the working class will realize they're being thrown out of work. The factories are closing down. They have to wait months and months for everybody to eat up all or use up all the commodities so they can start making them again. So they will somebody take over the factories and start to make things for need, the people's need and to serve people instead of for individual profit for a ruling class at, at their expense, which means you can't skip stages. There's not going to be a bunch of peasants taking over a country and somebody comes along and says, let's make a great leap forward, guys, and we'll just jump over the capitalist right into socialism that um, you might find that you 
end up with a big famine and millions of people dying. <laughs> you just can't skip stages. This is the problem that happens when, because of wars, the ruling classes of Europe and in Asia were unable to properly develop their own system without these great world wars that they had in the last century, in which workers and peasants were used as cannon fodder. And they wouldn't put up with it, and they started revolutions, and they got the idea of revolutions from Marx and Engels and Lenin and Russia, who had a re successful revolution. And they took over countries that were not as developed in the model as high as Marx had expected them to be for these revolutions. And, and as we know, they all broke down and uh, they practically disappeared off the face of the earth. The Chinese had been able to survive because they are, they're domesticated capitalism. And they are going through a capitalist stage, but their socialist and communist party is controlling that development. And so it's the capitalists that are not calling the shots over there. The working class through their party is calling the shots on the capitalists. We're over here when there's an economic problem, the capitalists put all the onus of that on the working class and the working workers suffer while the capitalists still make their money. In China, when they have an economic problem, it's the capitalists, not the workers that get the onus put on them. So this is how it goes on in the real world, but you need that model to understand what's going on. And if you think of it as laws rather than tendencies, you'll, you'll tend to think that you're gonna do this because it's inevitable. It might, if it's a tendency, it's not necessarily inevitable. It can backfire on you. So reading these things, these prefaces will give you um, some of these ideas. Now, another thing Marx points out is since we are talking about a developed, wanting to give a scientific, not so emotional stuff you mean to me, a scientific analysis of how capitalists work and how capitalists are driven, the system itself has to continually expand. It, it lives off surplus value that workers work more than they need to to make their living, that excess time that they work, the capitalist takes and the products that they made at that time, he sells those, that's what he makes his profits on. <clears throat> and the workers just get back enough to live on. That system has to continually expand to make markets and continually expand because they're all competing different countries, different capitalists, Machinery is being improved. If they can sell their stuff a little cheaper, uh, they'll do it. Uh, <clears throat> so this competition drives the system forward scientifically and expanding its markets. So if you read the Communist Manifesto, we already had the, uh, what we talk about globalization was already fully going on in 1848. The British were in India, they were in Egypt, the, South America had been taken over there in Africa, splitting that up a little later, but they split that up in, in the colonies, fighting over markets uh, for their for their products. It's when they, it's when that's all done, the whole world there is when boom, you'll start to collapse. Okay, the capitalists do what they do, not because they're greedy, not because they're mean, not because they're nasty. They do it because they have to do it. They have to lay off. If Mexican workers are going to work cheaper, you have to move your car factory down there so you can make your car cheaper and sell it under the prices that the other, if you're in trouble, the other capitalists are making their cars and you're not making yours, yours aren't selling. If you can cut the prices of your car and get the market, your company will survive. You go down to Mexico and you hire Mexicans. Whoop, everybody's got to go after you. You got to go over to China. People say that we got rid of our industrial working class. No, the United States capitalists still have an industrial working class working for them. They happen to be in China, the Chinese working class that is the big manufacturing class for the, for the American capitalists. That's why the Communist Party is there to make sure that those workers are not super exploited and that they get a good living standard, plus they can also help the Chinese 
begin to economically develop so they can become self-sufficient. <clears throat> Lenin said once, the capitalists will sell us the ropes we hang them with. And that's, that's, that's a good example, but it, it's a long process. It can take, take uh, a generation or two. Okay, so can't skip stages. Oh, here's the moral thing. Marx says his system does not hold individual capitalists. Like we don't, we're not interested in all this moral condemnation. They have to do it because that's how the system goes. So he would probably say something like, you should live, Jeff Bozos had his little trip to space if he wants to. <clears throat> what he's doing is what he has to do to fight the other capitalists. He's got to have these warehouse workers. What he should be doing if he were smart is he should give them a union. He should, he's got billions and zillions of dollars. He can fly around in space with them. He could probably double the income of all of his workers and it wouldn't affect him at all. And he'd have a big, but they don't think that way. Uh, because they say, well, we got to, there may be another depression. I got to, the Chinese wall, I got to get rid of Walmart. <clears throat> so while all that's going on, you get caught up in the grindstone. But they could be nice people. You know, they're not all the Koch brothers. Okay, they're some nice philanthropists around somewhere. We may not, I mean, they may, you know, be in Finland somewhere. I don't know where they are. Anyway, the reason that capitalism works and the reason that reform doesn't work and they look at their enemies is that capitalism is a, based on self-interest. My company, my interest, my class interest is the bourgeoisie. And Marx says there is nothing more ferocious in, the, in history than the furies of self-interest. <clears throat> and when self-interest conflicts with the general welfare under capitalism, the general welfare goes down. You'd see the climate crisis is a perfect example of that. The scientists working for the big oil companies tell them 30 or 40, 50 years ago, dude, you know, it's destroying the environment. You know, the whole planet could burn up. Forget it. We got to get this money. We got to get our fighting the Russians. They got oil. We got to have oil. So they just bury that and say, let the next generation worry about it. It'll be 100 years from now. Well, they're, now they're finding out it's not 100 years from now. <laughs> it's, it's, already, it's already started. And we are still, our president, Biden, made this great big speech about how he's going to do, he wants to do climate change. He also just tried to open up a whole new area uh, uh, in the United States to oil explo exploration. So you can't, you can't do that and fight climate change. So, and it's not that Biden is evil, it's that he's in competition with other oil companies and our oil companies in competition with other oil companies. The Russians are over there, uh, they're, they're, Putin is living off of basically most of his income is coming out of petroleum products. And he 30% of the industrial base of the European Union is Russian gas that's coming in there through Nord Stream 1. They stopped Nord Stream 2. They're all upset about Putin, what a bad guy he is and everything. If they really want to cripple Russia and end that military thing, they'll turn off Nord Stream 1, which is where he's getting most of his money from, but if they do that, they cut off 30% of their own gas and their whole economy will begin to collapse in Europe. So it's all blah, blah, blah about uh, sanctions and everything because he knows that they can't cut him off. And even if they do, he has a good friend in Xi Jinping who's for him. So he doesn't, he doesn't have to worry. But that, that is another story. When Marx wrote the Civil War had ended, over here in the United States and Reconstruction had started. And everybody thinks, like when I was your age, Carlos, I thought that when I was now my age, I would be living under socialism, okay? And I'm sure when you're my age, you will be telling some young person, well, maybe it'll be you who see it, okay? Marx and Engels thought it was like the people in the Old Test New Testament. Jesus said, I'll be back before some in this generation have passed away. And that's 2,000 years later, so they haven't gotten the message, evidently. 
Marx and Engels also thought that the revolution was going fast. The workers were getting ready. They were getting united. The unions were forming. The German Democratic Socialist Party was, was, was growing. And uh, the slavery had been destroyed over here in the United States. Reconstruction was going. Marx really thought that this was the beginning of Soon there would be the revolution and the, trans the transfer uh, of, of power to the working class. Uh, Engels also thought that might be coming soon, but we know that capitalism had many more resources than uh, we thought it had, and it, it, it's still around. And, but we, the contradictions are still there, the problems are still there, the model that Marx left us in Thus, capital is still how capitalism works. It will, if it's not restrained, it will cause wars. It will try to conquer people. The United States tried to conquer Vietnam and put the Vietnamese people under, under the control of big international corporations. Uh, that's the whole reason the French were there, was to get their wealth. And, and get, they lost that. They lost the workers fought back and peasants fought back and they now they are masters of their own destiny as are the Chinese and the people in Laos and the, Cu and the Cubans.